Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching video 2, Exchange Server User Management. In this video, we're going to start off by looking at our new installation of Exchange 2003. So we're going to go over to our Exchange server and get a feel for exactly what's different on this Server 2003 machine. And we're going to get a real good comfort level with the different tools that we're going to use going forward to manage Exchange 2003. After we do that, we're then going to go into the creation of mailboxes and mail enabling user accounts. And we're going to spend some time really nailing down the difference between mailbox enabling and mail enabling when we're dealing with user accounts. After that, we're going to finish up with some advanced features, things like adding additional email addresses to user accounts, setting up individual mailbox storage limits, and also forwarding email outside of Exchange Server to third-party email addresses like Yahoo or Hotmail, those sorts of things. Okay, let's go ahead and minimize here, and we're now going to form a remote desktop connection over to Exchange One. Now this is logging us on to Exchange One as the enterprise admin, domain admin, and an exchange admin, so we really have full permissions to the domain as well as the exchange server that we've logged on to. And just as a reminder, in this test lab scenario here, we have Active Directory and Exchange Server installed on the same machine. Now, I've said this several times already, but it's very important in a production environment that you separate these roles. Active Directory should be on one server, Exchange Server should be on another server, unless you're in a budget situation that requires you to put both of these onto one server. Okay, so when we installed Exchange 2003, we looked at this a little bit in our last video. But if you come up here to Exchange, you see that we have several different options here once we open up the Exchange program group. Our first one is additional resources, and these links here are just going to take you out to Microsoft websites that are going to help you out with technical information, tools and updates, and then the main Exchange website that you see here. The second folder is deployment, and these can be useful to you if you're in a situation where you want to clean up your Active Directory accounts or you're migrating from a foreign uh, mail server system. Okay, let's start off with this migration wizard and take a look at what we're talking about. So this is a wizard here, and it, it's telling you right here it's going to help you migrate user accounts to Exchange. And if we click Next, we get a feel for where we're migrating these user accounts from. Okay, so we might have user accounts or email accounts more specifically in Lotus CC Mail, Lotus Notes, Novell GroupWise, or even an older Exchange system such as Exchange 5.5 or MS Mail, even older than that. Okay, so if you're in a, the migration situation, this is what you're going to be using. This tool is included with Exchange 2003. Going back to our Exchange program groups and then the deployment folder, we also have the Active Directory Account Cleanup Wizard, and this is really self-explanatory. Um, if we have multiple user accounts within Active Directory because we've migrated accounts over, um, we've just created several user accounts for a user for whatever particular reason, this is going to help us to kind of uh, combine all these users together and make sure that we don't have multiple accounts for any one particular user. And the same thing can happen with groups, those sorts of things as well. Okay, now onto the show. Our main two tools that we're going to be working with are the Active Directory Users and Computers tool and then the System Manager. Okay, these two tools we're going to be using predominantly throughout this course. Now, System Manager, this is the main tool we'll be using when we're working with Exchange Server, kind of on the server side is one way I like to look at it. And then Active Directory Users and Computers, this is where we're working with the actual uh, individual users. Anytime you want to create a mailbox, make changes to a user's mailbox, um, any sort of individual settings, that's going to be done within Active Directory Users and Computers. Okay, so just to give you a general feel for what's going on here. Okay, so let's go over System Manager and Active Directory here just briefly. If we open up Active Directory Users and Computers, you probably already have a familiarity with Active Directory Users and Computers. And when we look at it, upon first glance, there's really not a lot that's different, you know, with our Active Directory Users and Computers, even when we have Exchange installed. Okay, and that's on the surface. We're going to see several different things that are different once we get into here and start messing around with these user accounts a little bit more. Okay, but just looking here right now, this actually is a group that was created uh, by myself. This is not even part of the exchange uh, installation process. We do have some groups that are created. If we go down here, we see that we have exchange. Let's go ahead and open this up a little bit here. Exchange domain servers, exchange enterprise servers, and then a couple user accounts here for built-in, anonymous, or internet access. Okay, so these were added as part of the exchange installation. 
Let's go over to System Manager. We're going to come back and we're going to spend the majority of this video working with this particular tool and then setting up mailboxes with user accounts, but we're not quite ready for that. Let's go take a look at our System Manager tool first, and we can get there just by going back up into that Exchange Program Group and then opening up System Manager. Now this is your default view when you first open up System Manager. Okay, and we look here, we have, you know, basically six main folders, global settings, recipients, servers, connectors, tools, and folders. And this really is not supposed to mean anything to you right now. Not a lot of information um, is going to come from this until you start digging in and getting a better feel for what Exchange Server is all about. One thing we can talk about, though, is kind of the hierarchy that's involved within this Exchange System Manager tool. At the top level here, this was specified during our installation, but this is the Exchange Organization. And we, we specified this name, Sophie's Toy Box Company, during the actual installation of Exchange Server 2003. So this is referred to as our organization, and this is kind of like a domain is within Active Directory users and computers, in the sense that everything else falls underneath this top level piece. So if I set permissions up here or any sort of settings that are set at the organization level, they're going to trickle down or propagate down and affect all of these child objects underneath. Okay, and then the same thing works as well. If I were to expand global settings, I see that we have a couple things in here, three things in here. Well, these then are child objects of global settings. Any permissions or anything that I assign to the global settings folder, anything there is going to trickle down or propagate down to these particular leaf objects as well. Okay, and if we go ahead and expand this out, we'll see that we have quite a few different pieces that we can look at and manage within Exchange System Manager. Okay, so we don't need to get too far ahead of ourselves at this point right now. We'll keep this pretty much an overview at this, at this point. Now one thing that you can do, and I want to go over right away, you may open up an Exchange System Manager tool and it's going to look a little bit different than what you see right here. And that's because we do have the option, if we right click the organization and then go down to Properties, we have the option of changing our administrative view. Okay, and we can configure whether or not we want to use routing groups and administrative groups. So basically right now for simplicity, these are turned off because they're unchecked. If you have a larger organization, you may very well use routing groups or administrative groups. And we're going to talk about both of these in a later video. If you do use these, or if you just want this view, okay, even if you're not really using them, you know, we're going to be using this view anyway, so we're going to leave both of these checked, and we click OK. Here it tells us we need to exit and restart the Microsoft Exchange System Manager. It's kind of lying to you here, you'll see in a second. Notice here right now we have six different container objects. When I click OK, one of them disappears. We now only have five. So it's kind of strange. You may think that it's going to add additional things because remember when we went in here, we said we want to see these and now all of a sudden one disappears. What's happened is just a reorganization of how you see things. This administrative groups uh, folder was added. If we open this up, we now see the servers container that we used to see up here at the root, and we also have routing groups as well. So it's just kind of a reorganization of how you look at things. Now we're going to leave our views like this and just take a quick gander at some of the different things we can manage within this uh, Exchange System Manager. Okay, normally we won't see our folders up here. I'm going to go ahead and refresh this so we get a feel for how to look. We have global settings at the top, okay, and we, we see things like internet message formats, message delivery, which we can control some organization-wide message de uh, delivery stats, like um, the maximum size of an email that can be sent inbound or outbound. Here you see mobile services. Uh, Exchange 2003 is set up to work with mobile devices, like pocket PC devices. This is where we'd configure that. Recipients, we manage all of our recipient objects uh, here, all the details surrounding them anyway. Things such as address lists, uh, address templates. We have our recipient update service. Uh, and basically what these are, this is going to be used anytime we update our recipients. And we're going to spend some time talking about recipients here real quick. Administrative groups. This is where we're going to be spending the, the majority of our time in these videos. If you open up the administrative groups and drill down here a bit, we see that we get down to servers, and here's our actual exchange server right here. We continue to open this up, and we see things called storage groups, mailbox stores, mailboxes, okay, which is going to show you all the exchange mailboxes, and we don't have any in here right now. Logons, anybody who's currently logged on to the exchange server full text indexing, here's our public folder store, uh, protocols, here's where we go to manage individual protocols that Exchange Server uses, 
HTTP and SMTP are going to be the ones we're going to be working with most, but we also have IMAP, NNTP, and POP3 here as well. Okay, and then we have this X.400 connector. We won't be working with this at all, but this is really used for uh, connecting to legacy devices. X.400 was used in Exchange 5.5, and some other messaging systems use X.400 as well. So you may have to use this uh, in your organization. Let's close this up a bit here. Um, then going down a little bit further, we have tools, uh, some different tools that we can use. We're going to look at these in our management video. Uh, the Message Tracking Center, the Mailbox Recovery Center, which is new in 2003. And then we have public folders. This is where we manage our public folder trees. We have a whole video dedicated to public folders, so we'll kind of save ourselves for that. Okay, so this is really meant to be just an overview, give you a quick look at the Exchange System Manager. But to repeat, what I want you to know for right now, this System Manager tool is really used uh, to manage server-side settings. Things are going to be set up by the administrator um, on the in or within Active Directory. Now we're getting more granular with our settings. We're setting up individual mailboxes, um, individual mailbox settings. Anything pertaining directly to the user account is pretty safe to say that you're going to be doing that within Active Directory users and computers. Okay, we're going to move forward, and next we're going to talk about Exchange Server Native Mode. Okay, our next little item here on the list, and we have a special slide just for Native Mode. When we're referring to Exchange Server Native Mode, we want to compare this to Mixed Mode. So it's Mixed Mode or Native Mode. Now, by default, our Exchange Server is in Mixed Mode, and that's how it stands right now. Our choice, if we want to upgrade our machine to Native Mode, basically what we're doing is ending backwards compatibility with Exchange 5.5. Okay, it's not cutting off uh, compatibility with Exchange 2000. Exchange 2000 and Exchange 2003 are very similar and the features offered in 2000 and 2003 are both going to be available in Exchange Native Mode. Okay, these are different than mode settings in Active Directory. So we've already upgraded our domain to Native Mode. That was done in the previous video. Okay, well now we have another option to upgrade our Exchange Server organization to Native Mode as well. So these, these are independent settings of each other. Um, you don't have to do both. You don't have to do either of them. It just depends upon what's important to your organization. Now, like we said, it's mixed mode by default, and it's a one-way switch to native mode. So once we upgrade, we can't switch our organization back to mixed mode. Limitations of mixed mode. Here are the only two things that are really different um, when we're talking about native mode. And that's, one, sites function as administrative and routing groups. Okay, well, in Exchange 5.5, there wasn't such thing as administrative groups. They only had routing groups. And the routing groups that were used in Exchange 5.5, they acted both as uh, routing groups as they do in Exchange 2003. We're going to talk a lot about those later on, as well as administrative groups. So it was, for right now, just to remember, it was, you know, basically one and the same. In Exchange 2003, as well as 2000, we have two separate entities, one called administrative groups, one called routing groups, offers us much more flexibility. So in a larger organization where you need to take advantage of both of these, you're really going to be upgrading to native mode just for this reason alone. Second thing, in exchange native mode, we can um, basically move our mailboxes to different administrative groups. Okay, we couldn't do that prior to, or we couldn't do that in exchange 5.5, we can't do that in mixed mode. Okay, so in mixed mode, mailboxes cannot be moved to a different administrative group. Okay, and, and not a big deal in a smaller organization once again. You really wouldn't even notice if you're in mixed mode or native mode in smaller organizations. It's not going to affect you too much one way or the other. Let's go ahead and upgrade to native mode with that being said, just so you see how it's done and where it's done. So we're going to minimize here, and we're going to connect back over to Exchange 1. Okay, so we're on Exchange 1. Here you see that we're in with uh, Exchange System Manager. So once again, it's just all programs, Exchange, and then System Manager. We're going to go ahead and close one instance of it. Now what we need to do is just right-click on our organization up top, and we're going to go to Properties, and then down below we see Change Operation Mode. Okay, And this is the exact same screen that we were working with before when, when we enabled the view of routing groups and administrative groups. So I just need to click Change Mode, it's going to warn me basically that once this is complete we can't go back. I click yes and just like that very very simple now we've been switched up to native mode when we click OK. In a larger organization with multiple exchange servers this setting will take some time so don't assume that you can do things instantaneously. Give this setting some time to take place it's going to have to replicate over to the different exchange servers. 
Okay, let's go back then here and open up our uh, OneNote program here. And the next slide we're going to look at is on recipient objects and mail types. And we want to define this a little bit so you're comfortable with the term recipient objects because you will see that thrown around um, in exchange books, on exchange websites, and you should be familiar with what recipient objects are. And it's really straightforward. It's any object that receives mail from an exchange server. Okay, any objects that receive email from an exchange server. So what can these be? Well, this could be an Active Directory user account. Okay, so just like we set up previously for uh, Bob Bass, for Frank Bullhead, some of the other user accounts, any account with an Active Directory, well, it's a recipient object and you have the ability to set up email. Active Directory groups, both security and distribution groups, um, they can be set up, the recipient objects, because they can be set up with email addresses. Okay, Contacts. Contacts are not Active Directory user accounts, but basically you might want to call these third-party or outside contacts that are not part of your organization. We're going to go through and we're going to set up a contact later on in this video and show you how we can mail enable this contact. And then lastly, public folders. Okay, now public folders, we're going to spend uh, a lot of time, we got a whole dedicated video to public folders, but essentially you can mail enable a public folder. We could have a public folder called sales and then set that folder up so any email that comes in from outsiders, let's say we have a sales organization and people want more information about our products, they can send an email out to sales at whatever your domain is dot com and it's going to come inbound and actually go into that public folder. So that's available to anybody who has, you know, permissions to access that public folder. Okay, and we'll spend some time on that, so don't worry about that too much right now. It's good enough in this video just to realize that these are our recipient objects right here. Okay? Now remember, recipient objects then are objects that can receive email. Now the type of email they receive is defined below when we say mail types. Okay, so recipient objects can be one of the following. They can either be mailbox enabled or mail enabled. Okay, just the difference being this box right here. Mailbox enabled or mail enabled. Okay, and this is just referring to whether or not they have a mailbox on the Exchange server or they have some sort of external email address. Okay, this is an external email address that we're just aware of within Active Directory. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about this. So when we say mailbox enabled, these are recipient objects that actually have a mailbox on the Exchange server. They can send and receive email through Exchange. Okay, and then when we're using examples, Active Directory user accounts, like we set up Bob Bass and Frank Bullhead, they can be mailbox enabled. Okay, so they can actually have a mailbox within Exchange server, and they're going to be able to send email through it and also receive email directly from that Exchange server. Contacts and Active Directory groups, they cannot be mailbox enabled. Okay, they're going to be what we call mail enabled. Now, mail enabled are recipient objects that have email addresses with Exchange, but they do not have mailboxes. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, if we continue on here, we'll get a better uh, understanding and then we'll use some examples. They can only receive messages from the Exchange server, but they, they cannot send messages to it. Okay, and Active Directory users can be mail enabled if we choose. So can contacts and Active Directory groups. All of these can be mail enabled. Okay, and public folders as well. We didn't mention that, but public folders can be mail enabled as well. What this essentially means, Remember, when I said mailbox enabled up above, that means that you have a mailbox on the Exchange server, and that Exchange server is going to hold email for you. Email or mail enabled, this basically means we've associated an email address with your user account. So you probably have an AOL account or a Hotmail account or a Yahoo account, and you don't have an actual mailbox on our server. But our users within our company, within Sophie's Toy Box company, they want to be able to send email to you and they want to be able to pull your email off of an address list. Okay, so for example, we're going to, we're going to set up an Active Directory user account here in a little bit who's mail enabled and her email address is going to be sstarfish at aol.com. So she's mail enabled because she has an external email address and she does not have a, a mailbox basically installed or configured on that Exchange server. And that's the same thing we're going to be doing with contacts, you know, an outside contact that uh, different people within your organization may all want to be able to, you know, reach through their email address, as well as Active Directory groups. Okay, a group like sales, for example, we can mail enable the sales group, and then when people send email to sales at sophiestoybox.com, we'll set that up a little bit later, well, then that email is going to be delivered to all the members of the sales group. 
it's not a special or a separate mailbox it's just it's mail enabled there's an email address associated with the group and then in turn when somebody sends an email the exchange server is going to look at that it's going to expand the actual list out and go oh okay i've got 10 different users who have mailboxes on my exchange server that are part of that sales group i'm going to deliver this one email to each one of these 10 different mailboxes okay so that's the differences we're talking about when we say mailbox enabled and mail enabled Let's go take a look. I think this will make a little bit more sense when we go look at the actual setup of this on the Exchange server. Okay, so we're back to our desktop here. We're going to connect over to Exchange 1 using Remote Desktop again, and I've already got that connection formed. So I'm just going to go ahead and open this back up. Okay, and we don't need System Manager because we're now working with individual user accounts. So we're going to be working with Active Directory users and computers. And I've got a uh, shortcut up here, so I'm just going to open this up. And we're going to follow along here uh, somewhat with what we see in the book, but we're also going to add some extra material here as well. Now, as a starting point, you know, we've got this admins OU selected here. And what I want to take a look at is go over with you the actual administrator accounts that I've set up here already. Now, this here you can see is the built-in account for administering the computer or domain. And this is our default administrator account that was set up when we first installed Active Directory. Now, this administrator account I mentioned before should probably be renamed um, you know we're talking about a small company here so they don't have a dedicated administrator I'm acting as the outside consultant so when I come into this company here's the user account that I use to actually log on and access this uh, domain and exchange server okay now when I first logged on and first created this user account I went ahead and I added myself you know and made myself a member of administrators domain admins enterprise admins exchange admins everything that that default administrator account is part of as well okay and you should do this for any different administrator who's going to be accessing your active directory or exchange server everybody should not be using one administrator account this account here should be renamed to a secure name it should have a very secure password and you should lock that away and only use this for really emergency purposes you shouldn't really be using this account for individuals okay that being said so we've told you about this. We've told you how I set up my user accounts. A couple things we need to do before we start giving away email addresses to everybody is talk about a special or a couple special email accounts that we need to worry about. And one of those is the Postmaster account, and the second one is the Webmaster account. Okay, just about any email domain that you're dealing with has a Postmaster account and a Webmaster account, and they both have special significance. The Postmaster account especially this postmaster account basically any time a non-delivery message is sent it's sent from the postmaster so for example let's say that uh, somebody outside the organization attempts to send an email to uh, Bob Bass but instead of using his proper email address he addresses it using his whole first name and whole last name um, that email is going to get bounced back to the sender because our exchange server is not going to have an email address for Bob Bass now it's going to come back from the postmaster account that's who the uh, non-delivery report is going to come back from a lot of times users will then try to contact the postmaster and then ask them to help them out hey I'm trying to contact Bob Bass can you give me his proper email address you know so on and so forth so what we want to do is we want to try to assign the postmaster account to some user who's going to be checking this account on a regular basis okay now I'm an outside consultant working for Sophie's Toy Box Company so that's not gonna be me you know I'm by all means if I if I check my account here okay we'll we'll talk about this in a second why it is but my account has been assigned postmaster at Sophie's Toy Box now like I said I'm an outside consultant I'm not gonna be checking this for this particular company because it's it can be very time consuming and it's you know maybe they don't even want me to check it if I volunteered for that well what you need to do then is pick out a user who'd be responsible for handling all those non-delivery reports and non-delivery messages okay the other account we mentioned before is webmaster and this is commonly used um, sometimes people just send a, a random email to webmaster at your because they expect to have an email account addressed to that particular user so you kinda want to assign the webmaster account to a particular person as well and you may have some other special accounts that you may want to affiliate with one particular user in your company now you may have an administrator let's say you have a dedicated administrator or you're the dedicated administrator for your company well you could set that up for yourself then and you could get all of those particular emails okay but in this particular organization what we're gonna do we're gonna leave this administrator account as it is and we're going to assign both postmaster and webmaster to this administrator account 
So we're going to do that a little bit later. We're not going to do that right now, but this is something that you want to uh, pay particularly close attention to, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit. So we're not going to assign it yet. A little bit later on in this video, we're going to talk about how we change it, why we change it, and just talk about some strategy involved with that. Okay, going forward, let's get back to the basics here. And what we're going to do first is go out to an existing user account. Uh, actually, let's go to this administrator account first. I want to show you one thing. This account, by the way, I logged on with this account um, when I installed Exchange Server. Okay, and, and the reason for me telling you this is because by default, this account has already been set up with an Exchange mailbox. If I come over here to email addresses, I see that this account has been assigned Scott A. Skinger at Sophie's Toy Box Local. So it's just taken my you know logon name. This is actually the display name. The logon name for this account is Scott A. Skinger. And then it's also assigned this account the Postmaster, okay, the dreaded Postmaster account that I was telling you about before. So eventually we're going to have to change this since I'm the consultant and just coming in here on a, uh, you know, every once in a while basis. Okay, for right now we're going to leave this as is. Um, but this is important because this is the only account that is set up and is uh, mailbox enabled when we first install Exchange Server. If we take a look, for example, at this other administrator account, I'm going to just right click and go to properties here. I come over here to the right and there are no email address tabs. Okay, those tabs have not been added to this particular account yet. So this user account is not mailbox enabled. Okay, another way we can tell that is to come up here to view and then go to add remove columns. And what I'm going to do is add a couple columns here that'll make our life a little bit easier when we're working with Exchange. And that's our email address tab and then also our exchange alias. Okay, I want to see both of these um, and I'm going to move these up. Okay, name, I don't really care about uh, the name, the type, we can kind of get by that. So I'm going to move name, then email address, and then exchange alias, then type, then description. So when I click OK now, you see that this shows up here. So if I come back in here to admins, let's adjust this here just a little bit so we can see as much as possible. Okay, we don't really care about the description right now. Okay, and you can see right here that the uh, Scott A. Skinger account has an email address associated with it. Here's the email address associated with it, that long thing. And then the actual exchange alias. The administrator account, however, does not have an email address. Okay, and this goes hand in hand with what I was talking about a second ago. Since this account has not been mailbox enabled, it does not have an email address. It does not have an exchange alias, and it doesn't have those tabs that we saw when we looked at my account. Once again, if we go here to the properties, here are the tabs that I'm talking about. Okay, starting with exchange general, email addresses, exchange features, and then exchange advanced, these four tabs. Okay, and if we look at the other user accounts as well, none of these other user accounts have these features either. So I'm just clicking through any of these, and you can see none of them have email addresses or exchange aliases right now. Let's start taking care of that. Okay, what do we do when we want to actually add an email address to Bob Bass? Well, first off, Bob Bass is a manager in this company, and he is um, going to be here all the time. Basically, what we want to do is set up a mailbox for him. His mailbox is going to be set up on the Exchange server. We want to have complete control over him, so we're not going to set up an external email address like we had mentioned before. Okay, and just so there's no confusion, when you're setting up mailboxes or trying to decide whether or not to mailbox enable or mail enable an account, the vast majority of your users in the company are going to be mailbox enabled. Okay, candidates for mail enabled, where you have an external email address, these could be traveling employees or people who really are outside of the company uh, the vast majority of the time and have a real difficult time even connecting to the Exchange server. Okay, because when you use an external account, you're losing all the benefits of Exchange Server. So we want to try to set up mailboxes for as many of our users as possible. So that's what we're going to do for Bob Bass, and it's a pretty simple task. What we need to do, right-click Bob Bass, go down to Exchange Tasks, okay, and then you get our Exchange Task Wizard here. Um, this is going to pop up every time unless we click this button here to not show this welcome page again, so we'll do that. Then I click Next. And here you see we have three different tasks that we can perform, creating a mailbox, establishing an email address, or removing exchange attributes. Okay, so we're going to focus on these first two right now. Creating a mailbox is going to do exactly what we talked about a second ago, and that's creating a mailbox for this particular user. It's going to set this up on the Exchange server. Establishing an email address, here you see right here, it's establishing an external email address for a user or for a contact. So we're creating a mailbox for Bob Bass, and we just click Next. 
Okay, and you see that the alias comes up. This is just the default username, B Bass, and I do recommend that you leave this as is. Okay, you could change it if you wanted to, but there's really no reason. It's just going to cause confusion. Server, we only have one exchange server right now, so you don't have much choice here. If you have multiple exchange servers, of course, right here, you can choose which server you want to actually put this mailbox on. So you can do a little bit of load balancing by just going back and forth. Um, or if you have a particular user, maybe you have your manager's mailboxes on a particular server. Okay, mailbox store. Then with, or within that actual uh, server, you can actually choose the mailbox store. So this allows you to choose an individual mailbox store or a separate database. This is something we're going to talk a lot about in a future video. So let's just leave this as is for now. Click next. Okay, and you see we have one success just like that. You know, it's that easy. Bob Bass now is an exchange mailbox on the exchange server. Okay, but wait a second. No email address, no exchange alias. Just have to be patient. Okay, and if I'm going to hit F5 here, refresh this. Our alias has popped up. We still don't have an email address. Okay, wait a couple more seconds. If we refresh it again, we still don't have it. But within, I would say, 30 seconds to a minute, you usually have both an email address and an exchange alias. Okay, we still don't have ours yet. So we'll give it a second here. Okay, we'll actually go, let's go into the property so we're not waiting because this is going to be the next thing we do anyway. So if I right click Bob Bass and go to properties, let's go check this out real quick. Okay, Bob Bass now has these four tabs we were talking about before. These are only going to be present when you have an account uh, mailbox enabled or uh, mail enabled. Okay, so we have Exchange General, Email Addresses, Exchange Features, and then Exchange Advanced. At the end of this video, we're going to spend some time on each one of these tabs. We'll spend some more time identifying what each of these different pieces are. So we're not skipping over this. It's just we're going to wait till we get some more information in our heads before we drill down on these individual tabs. Okay, and I think now if we hit F5, yes, we have our email address. So now you see that he's been assigned bbass at sophiestoybox.local. Now at this point, you may be wondering, how the heck are we going to get external email from the internet to this particular user okay because his email address is showing up as bbass at sophie's toy box dot local and of course dot local is not a routable domain over the internet you know we've got dot com and dot org and dot net and dot edu but dot local is just not going to work we'll take care of that that's actually going to be a couple videos down the road here but this is going to be set up so we're actually going to have Sophie's toybox.com be his real email address and we'll see that change take place uh, like I said two or three videos from now okay another thing we can do this is uh, how we would do it if we wanted to go through one by one and actually set up individual users with uh, mailboxes I'm gonna click over to sales here and then show you what we can do if we wanted to mailbox enable several different users at one time okay in this case I can just select multiple users and I'm holding down the control key right now just as you would if you were working uh, you know in Outlook or any other program okay any office program I'm holding down control and I'm selecting multiple accounts now I'm gonna right click go to exchange tasks okay and I have a lot more things that I can do now well we're not gonna work on this stuff yet these you know these are uh, down the road here a little bit but we're gonna focus first on creating a mailbox okay so create a mailbox click next Notice that I can't choose an alias. And that's because we're now dealing with three different users. It's going to automatically generate an alias based upon the person's username. I also don't have the ability to put these uh, different users on different servers or different mailbox stores. So anytime I'm doing this, keep in mind that you're going to be using the default alias, you're putting all the users in the same server, and you're putting all of these users' mailboxes within the same mailbox store or mailbox database. We'll talk more about this later, like I said. That's okay, because that's what we wanted to do anyway, so we'll click Next. Okay, and just like that, we have three successes now. So a lot more efficient doing it three at a time instead of just doing it one by one individually. Okay, we'll let this kind of take care of itself, because the next thing we're going to do is actually right within this organizational unit as well. Okay, so we set up Bob Bass. We mailbox enable the sales team. What we're going to do now, what happens when you have a new user account? Okay, keep in mind that these user accounts were already here. We pre-populated this before we installed the Exchange server. But we've hired somebody new here for Sophie's Toy Box, and that user account, his name is Ray Moray. Okay, and it's a pretty simple procedure, so we'll go through this relatively quickly. This is just a standard user setup, and we're just going to put in our standard password. 
Okay, I'm gonna uncheck this just for simplicity. I click next. Now here's the um, area that I wanna point out to you. In this case, we wanna create an exchange mailbox. So we're just gonna leave this selected. If you didn't want an exchange mailbox for this user, you just have to deselect this. And we could go back in a later time and uh, either mailbox enable, mail enable, or do nothing with this account. Okay, in this particular case, we do wanna create an exchange mailbox. So leave this selected, click next, click finish. Okay, and just like that, it's set up for you. Now, if I hit refresh, let's try that again. We see that we have aliases and email addresses for the three users we set up before. Ray Moray should be coming up here any second now. Uh, no big deal, but we'll see that a little bit later on. We'll see that his email address should show up. Okay, and when we look at these, notice that all of them are taking on the Sophie's Toy Box Local, our default domain name, and all of these are using the first initial, last name, just like their user account. Okay, if we go in here and look at uh, Steve Trout, for example, here's his user account right here, S. Trout, and that matches up to his exchange alias as well that you see here. Okay, uh, S. Trout, S. Trout. So all this information matches up by default. Okay, going back over into OneNote, so we've taken care of mailbox enabling. What we're going to do now is go down to mail enabling. Okay, and if we look at our uh, overview list here, um, these two items pertain to mailbox enabling, and then we have really three different things we're going to work on as far as mail enabling. A user account, a group, and then also a contact. We're going to look at how we work with each of these and then what's the uh, relevance as far as using them within our Active Directory. Okay, so we're going to connect back over to Exchange 1 now. And the first person we're going to work with is Sophia Starfish. Okay, and Sophia Starfish, she's actually the owner of Sophie's Toy Box Company. She's out of the office all the time. Okay, she's really never in the office. So she doesn't want an exchange account because it's kind of a pain for her. She's been using her AOL account for years. And she still needs an Active Directory account because she will need to log on occasionally. She accesses sales reports and other things. She wants an actual uh, account within the network but she doesn't want to bother when she wants to check her email with having to connect to the Exchange server. So what you're going to do for her, let's go ahead and create a user account. Okay, and this is exactly the same as we saw before. Okay, so just the same user account. Try to use the same um, standard throughout first initial, last name. Click Next. Just put in our standard password here. Okay, click Next. Now here's a really important setting. Remember, we're not creating a mailbox. She's not going to have an exchange server mailbox. So we're going to deselect this. Okay, so none of this information is going to be relevant. We click Next and then Finish. So this user account that Sophia has will be able to, she, she will be able to use this to log on to Active Directory and access files, printers, internet, whatever it might be. Okay, but her email address, there is not one. There's, no, there's nothing assigned to her actual user account. Okay, if I right click now and go to exchange tasks I have a couple choices at a later time if I want to add a mailbox I can do that of course just by clicking create mailbox like we've done previously or we can go to establish email address and this is how we set up an external email address or mail enable her user account okay so here's her alias we do want to leave this and then here's the external email address there's nothing in here right now so if I click modify the first choice I have is the email address type. Okay, and if you look here, you see that we have, you know, Novell, Lotus Notes, CC Mail, uh, an old Microsoft Mail, uh, Legacy Protocol X.400, or some sort of custom address. Well, I skipped SMTP address because this is pretty much the de facto standard at this point, and you'll be using this almost in all situations. So go ahead and click SMTP, Simple Mail Transport Protocol Address, and then click OK. Now, this is where you just type in the uh, email address that Sophia uses. Okay, she uses the email address sstarfish at aol.com. So I click OK here, and this is now populated within the external email address field. So I click Next and Finish. Okay, and just like that, we've got this taken care of. If I hit F5 here, we don't have the email address associated with her yet, but hit it a couple more times here, and you'll see eventually that Sophia is going to have the email address appear just like Bob Bass's. Okay. Do notice though that it's sstarfish at aol.com and it's not Sophie's Toy Box .local. Okay, and this is important to stress. She does not have an exchange mailbox. So if somebody sent an email to sstarfish at Sophie's Toy Box .local, it's gonna bounce. Okay, so that's something that you want to consider. Now there are some workarounds to that. 
We'll talk about that a little bit more in a later video. Um, you may want to set up, you could actually set up a mailbox that forwards everything to this external account. That is something you could do if you wanted to give Sophia, uh, you know, a Sophie's toy box address as well. Okay, let's go ahead and right click Sophia, go to properties, and skate over here to our tabs. Notice that we still have tabs over here. We have the Exchange General tab. It's a little bit different looking than we had with the others. You haven't seen the, uh, I know you haven't looked at it a lot, but it is different. <clears throat> the Email Addresses tab, this is pretty much the same, although we've got a different SMTP address. And then the Exchange Advanced tab is also different. Now we are missing one tab, the Exchange Features tab, because Sophia does not have an Exchange mailbox, she can't take advantage of the features obviously associated with Exchange Server. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this. So that's basically how you set up a basic mail-enabled account with an Active Directory user. Now you also may want to set up a mail-enabled account with a non-Active Directory user. Okay, so for example, you may have an outside contact that you want to deal with, and you want to make this contact available to everybody within Active Directory. Okay, and, and for our example, what we're going to do Let's set up an outside vendors organizational unit. And I'm really doing this more so for anything, just for organization. Okay, we're not going to set up any group policies or anything to do with this, but just to put all of these outside contacts in the same place. Okay, and who we're using here basically is uh, Troy Trump. Okay, and we'll just make him Troy Trump. Okay, and then we have to assign an email address to them. So if we want to create an exchange email address, we click Modify, same choices as before. We're going to choose SMTP, and then enter in Troy Trump's email address. Okay, ttrump at jackinthebox.com, uh, some sort of, you know, jack-in-the-box manufacturer or uh, buyer, whatever it might be. Okay, so we enter that in, click OK. You see it's populated down here below. Click Next actually click back here make sure this checkbox is checked it is by default but make sure that's checked click next click finish and now Troy Trump also has a contact set up and notice the difference in the icon here okay this is gonna be within our Active Directory all the different users in the uh, company are gonna be able to see Troy Trump and access his email address okay if I hit F5 here and refresh a couple times eventually we're gonna get Troy Trump's email address appear here Okay, ttrump at jackinthebox.com. And when you're within Outlook, we're going to be seeing this in the next video we look at. You open up Outlook, you can actually access your global address list, and Troy Trump's email address is going to be available within your global address list. Okay, and that's going to be available to all the different users within your Active Directory. Okay, one more thing we want to look at here is mail enabling a group. We talked about this earlier, but hey, it would be really convenient if we had groups like this and instead of having to send an individual email to Sue and to Steve and to Ray and to Frank okay if we could just send it to sales and each one of these different users would get that okay and one thing I don't think we did we didn't add Ray to the sales group before so to do that just right click add to a group and I'm gonna quickly put him into sales here okay so Ray's now a member of the sales group and we should see an email address here if I refresh right now you see that his email address appears as well Okay, let's mail enable this sales group. Simple enough, right click, exchange tasks, establish email address on groups. Okay, pretty simple. Click next. The alias, what alias do you want to use? So this is what's going to show up in that uh, global address list uh, that we we're talking about before. So is this what you want to call it? Seems good, so let's call it sales. Click next. Okay, and we have a success. So if we click finish here, we're going to see if we right click on sales and then go to properties. We do have an email addresses tab, just hasn't been populated yet. Let's come back here a little bit later. Okay, so same thing. It's a little bit of a delay waiting for that email address field to fill in, but give it a couple seconds here, and you'll see that we have the sales at sophiestoybox.local appear here. Taking longer than the rest for some reason, so... When we come back up here, let's look at these other tabs though real quick. We have the Exchange General tab. So notice that you can limit message size or who can send messages to this group based upon the actual group. Email address, it's now been assigned finally. And then our Exchange Advanced tab. Okay, we have several different options that we can worry about here. Uh, who to send delivery reports to, um, message originator to the group owner, or no message delivery reports at all.
Okay, so quite a different, quite a few different things we can do, you know, with these uh, different pieces. Okay, going back over then to our main system. We look here, we've now covered our mail enabled accounts. Last things we talked about doing here are the special features. Additional email addresses and user accounts, mailbox storage limits, forwarding mail to outside email addresses. What we're going to do now is connect back over to Exchange One. I want to focus on each of the individual tabs within the user accounts. So we're going to take a look at what you can do with each different mailbox in Active Directory. Okay, so let's connect back over to Exchange One using a remote desktop connection. And we already have Active Directory users and computers opened up. This is where we're going to be managing uh, all of our different users and their Exchange mailboxes from. So we can select any user, but we're going to pick on Bob Bass because we tend to use him the most throughout this course. So what we want to do is just right-click Bob Bass, go down to Properties, and we're going to go over to the Exchange General tab. Okay, now from this Exchange General tab, there's several different things we can do. First off, you see the mailbox store location as well as the alias for the Bob Bass account. Um, let's take a look at delivery restrictions first, though, and take a look at what this is all about. Well, within here, and this is all on an individual basis, and let me start off by saying I don't recommend that you go through on individual users and start setting up uh, delivery restrictions for um, each individual user account. This is something that you want to focus in on only if you have a special case where you need to grant somebody uh, less restriction or more restriction would you really come into the individual user account. But you do have this ability by you know, specifying here the maximum message size or the maximum receiving size. We're going to leave the defaults. Down below you have message restrictions where here you can choose who this person can actually accept messages from. From everybody, from authenticated users only, only from or from everyone except for a couple users. So what you can do here, you've got uh, several things you can do. First off, the default basically allows us, like it says, to accept email from everyone within the company as well as outside users as well. If you wanted to, this is, uh, you know, happens sometimes, you may have a, a situation where you want your user only to receive email from um, people within the company and not people outside of the company. Okay, so be careful with this setting. In most situations, most companies, people want email to be received from outsiders as well. So, you know, be hesitant about choosing this. Down here below, however, you may do something like this where you choose only from certain users, and this probably is not going to be the case very often, but you might use this, from everyone except, okay, and this could, this could come in handy if you have um, maybe a couple buddies inside the office, and you want them to receive, you want this user, Bob Bass, to receive email from everybody um, but a couple users, and then here you can just add these particular users, either their Active Directory user accounts or a contact if it's an outside user. So what I can do is effectively block email from somebody that's uh, you know, sending email that really shouldn't be. Okay, I'm going to leave this at the default from everyone, and that's going to be the case in almost all situations. Our next choice is delivery options. Okay, now delivery options, our first choice up above is to send on behalf or grant this permission to. What this means basically is that you can choose somebody, you can grant them the permission to send email on your behalf. Now we're going to go over this in detail in the next video, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but real handy feature in situations where you, let's say a uh, executive has a secretary or an administrative assistant who they want to be able to send email on their behalf. Now the forwarding address, we cover this in the lab book, and we're going to walk through an example here, but this can come in handy when you want your email forwarded to an external email address. Okay, and you know, picture uh, in this case we're working with Bob Bass's user account and Bob Bass is going to be going on vacation. Now Bob does not have access to his email. He doesn't have access to the exchange server. Only occasionally will he be able to go into an internet cafe and uh, pop onto an internet cafe basically and check his Yahoo account. So what we're going to do in case there's some emergency or something that Bob really needs to access, we're going to choose to forward email to his Yahoo account. Now, this is a two-part process. Before we can actually go through this part, we need to exit out of here quickly. Okay, and we're going to create an external account for Bob Bass first. Okay, so this is the first step in doing this. Got to go to New, Contact. And this is just like we created the contact before for uh, Troy Trump. Okay, and I'm going to na label this external account so we know exactly what this is for later on when we're searching through Active Directory. 
okay? So we see the alias Bob Bass. Let's change that as well. Want everybody to know that this is an external account. Okay, click modify SMTP address. Okay, and now we're going to enter in his address. Okay, so a completely made up email address right now, but you know, this pretend that it is Bob Bass's uh, own personal Yahoo address, and this is where he's going to have email forwarded to. Okay, so you can see that we just go through here, click finish. Okay, Bob Bass, we can't use that name. Let's go back here again then. So we need to put in Bob Bass external account. Okay, so that's what it's referring to. So let's just next through here again, finish up, and now you see that we have this Bob Bass external account. Okay, in a couple seconds, you'll see that that email address will show up here. What we're going to do right now, however, um, first thing, let's go back in here again to the properties. And keep in mind, we do get these tabs that are going to show up here. Um, if we wanted to, maybe we don't want this to show up an address list where this is a personal account and Bob really doesn't want anybody sending email to him on his Yahoo account. Or it could happen, you know, by mistake. Somebody could be going through their uh, global address list and, you know, they don't want to see Bob Bass's account there and accidentally start sending mail to him instead of through the Exchange server. So you might choose Hide from Exchange Address List and then click OK. We're going to leave that alone, though, because I want to showcase this later on uh, in this video series. Okay, now you see Bob Bass's account pop up there, his email address. Okay, so back into Bob Bass's user account, we're going to go back to that Exchange General tab. Back to delivery options, back to forward to, and now we can click modify. And now what we need to do is basically check our Active Directory uh, for these contacts. So what I'm going to do here is just basically, uh, first we can select above user or other object. We'll leave that. I'm going to type in BO. Let's see what comes up here. We've got Bob Bass and we have Bob Bass External. Okay, we definitely don't want to forward to this account because what will end up happening, just keep forwarding emails to the same email address that we were already forwarding to, not a good thing. We want to forward email out to this Yahoo account. So I click, uh, click this, click OK, click OK again, and now you see that we're going to forward out to the Bob Bass external account. One more option you may want to select, deliver messages to both forwarding address and mailbox. This is especially a good choice in this situation. What's going to happen? Bob's email is going to be forwarded out to his Yahoo address. When he comes back from vacation, all of his email is going to be stuck in that Yahoo account, and he's going to have nothing saved locally. So he won't be able to archive things or maybe access email that wasn't as important that he didn't access on vacation. So by doing this, he's going to get email in both locations, and he can feel comfortable in just deleting the email off of his Yahoo server account. Okay, our last choice here is recipient limits. And this would limit the number of people that you can actually send an email to. So the default limit is set up on the actual exchange organization. I believe that's 5,000 by default, so quite a, quite a large number. Um, you can change that here. If Bob Bass is known for sending out a lot of jokes uh, out to huge recipient list, maybe you want to cut this down and only allow him to send out to 20 people or something. We're going to leave this alone right now, leave the defaults, and just click OK to save this. Okay, last choice here is storage limits. Okay, and this is going to basically set how much space Bob Bass can use up on the Exchange server. Okay, you've got a certain amount of space that you can use up, your mailbox size. We can issue warnings, prohibit sending of email, or prohibit sending and receiving of email if you cross a certain threshold. Okay, and you can see right here that right now, Bob Bass and every user account for that matter is using whatever is set up as the default. Okay, if you have a special situation, maybe a uh, VIP who needs more mailbox space, you can come in here, override the defaults, and set anything up here you wish. Or on the flip side, you may have a situation where you've got a user who's taking advantage of mailbox space, and you really want to limit them, crack, crack the whip or something, and make sure they can't take up too much storage space on your Exchange server. Down below, deleted item retention, we're going to spend some time in a couple different videos on this, but this basically is setting how long your items are going to be saved if you delete them. So when Bob Bass deletes an item out of Outlook, even when he deletes it out of his deleted items folder, how long are we going to save this on the Exchange server before we permanently delete it? Okay, as you can see, we're using the mailbox store defaults. We're going to leave that alone right now. Okay, next, email addresses. 
this is where the default email addresses are stored and created by default. Um, and here you see that we have an SMTP address and an X.400 address. Every time you mailbox enable a user account, you're going to get both an SMTP address and an X.400 email address. Um, we're really only focusing on this SMTP address because we've got an all exchange organization and we're really not going to be using this X.400 address at all. Okay, you can see Bob Bass's email address is bbass at sophiestoybox.local, which is great. This is what was set up by default. We do have the ability to directly edit this. Let's say that we want to use something else. Bob requests that he's a B-O-B, his name spelled out, bass at sophiestoybox.local. Well, we can click edit and actually change that email directly. Okay, or you can add additional email addresses. Okay, for example, in the lab book we have a, a mention, Bob Bass actually is in charge of human resources as well. Okay, keep in mind, Sophie's Toy Box is a small company, so people wear a lot of hats in those types of companies. So he's handling a lot of the HR duties as a manager. So we could set him up as HR at Sophie's Toy Box dot local. Okay, and the nice thing about doing it this way, uh, on our company intranet, within public folders, anywhere else, we can have this email address basically set up and associated with him. So anytime somebody has an HR question, they're going to direct it to HR at sophiestoybox.local. If in the future, however, maybe we hire a full-time HR person or Bob Bass leaves the company, I don't have to change all the different locations. Maybe instead of putting, you know, contact B Bass at sophiestoybox.local for your HR needs, we use just HR at sophiestoybox.local. Well, now in the future, I can just remove this from his uh, user account and add it to the new HR person. So it makes it a lot simpler. So we're going to leave that here, and we'll move on to the next tab, which is Exchange Features. Uh, by the way, the Set as Primary, this is just setting the primary SMTP address. You can see right now this one is bolded. The primary address is the one when you send a reply back to the user. This uh, primary address is what's going to be basically filled in. Okay, so it doesn't matter if uh, you send an email to HR at sophiestoybox.local. When they reply to you, it's going to be bbass at sophiestoybox.local who's sending you that email. Exchange features. This has all the different exchange features that you can enable on a user-by-user -user basis at this point. Okay, you see here we have mobile services turned on by default. Okay, and we have protocols. Outlook Web Access, POP3, IMAP4. All users have, a, have the ability to use any of these, but if for some reason, let's say you want to disable uh, Bob from using Outlook Web Access, real simple, just come in here, go to Protocols, click Disable, and just like that, he no longer has the ability to use the Outlook Web Access protocol. Okay, we don't want to save that setting. We're going to click Enable here so we don't run into a problem later on when we forget about this. Okay, so fairly simple setup here. It's just what you want a user to have or you don't want a user to have. If you want to enable or disable something uh, on a server basis instead of on an individual user by user basis, that's going to be done in the Exchange System Manager tool. Okay, now our last tab, Exchange Advanced. A lot of things we can do here. You probably won't be using this tab too much. Uh, a lot of ex uh, advanced things that are used in enterprises or for backwards compatibility with older exchange organizations. Okay, simple display name. If you're dealing with a uh, exchange organization or a different email system that can only receive email um, in simple names without spaces and without being too long, you can add a simple display name for Bob Ass's account. Probably something you'll never ever use, but just so you're familiar with what it's for. Uh, we already um, specify what this was for, hiding from exchange address list. If you don't want Bob Bass's email address to appear, his alias, email address, and anything associated with him in the global address list or any other exchange server address list, you can check this. And what's going to happen when somebody is using Outlook, they won't be able to look up Bob Bass's name um, in order to send him an email. Not something you want to do in this case, but this can be useful. Okay, downgrade high priority mail bound for X.400. Again, something you probably will never use, but in situations we're dealing with a old legacy X.400 system, uh, you may have to select this just to get email through to the system. Custom attributes, you can open this up and assign your own custom attributes. You can use social security numbers, employee numbers, uh, sales teams. Some way of basically what you can do is just assign custom attributes to each individual user account or a group of user accounts and then you can actually track messages based upon those custom attributes. ILS settings, okay, Internet Locator Service, 
This basically, you can specify an ILS server and an ILS account, and it makes it easier for users who are logging on to a server to get in contact with each other. And this is really used predominantly when we're using net meeting in a networked typed environment. Okay, we will be using these mailbox writes. We're going to see these in an upcoming video, but the mailbox writes allow you to actually assign permissions to Bob Bass's mailbox. Okay, as you can see right here, the only group or user that has permission to this mailbox is a group called self. Now this is a special administrative privilege. Once Bob Bass logs on and accesses his mailbox, this is going to change and this is basically just granting Bob Bass access, read permissions, and full mailbox access to his own mailbox. Okay, and if you look here, nobody else has these permissions. If you wanted to, let's say that you got another user in the organization, you want them to have access to Bob's mailbox as well, just add them, add their user account, come down here, select their, uh, select their user or group, and just give them the necessary permission. Okay, fairly straightforward. We'll talk about how that can be used, though, um, actually in the next video. Okay, that basically wraps up this video. Chalk full of lots of information. I hope you found this video informative. And we'll see you back here real soon when we go into video three, Outlook 2003 Configuration.